Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for, wow, what a big crowd as well. This is exciting. Um, so we're going to talk, Magda and I are doing a kind of double act this morning uh, about the joy and pain of building multilingual recommendation systems at BBC News. We need to work on shorter presentation titles, actually. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the kind of context, like what is World Service, why are we doing this, why do we care, and some of the kind of early experimentation that we've done, uh, and then hand over to Magda, who's going to talk about the science and the kind of technical stuff that I don't really understand much about, but she does. World Service is, um, as a lot of you will know, World Service is a, is a radio thing, um, but actually um, World Service is a digital service which is available in 40 different languages globally. Uh, and you can see from Peter Horrocks, who used to be the director of World Service until a little while ago, is talking about how it performs a really important function globally in that for countries where there's no independent media service, for example, if your media is state controlled or commercially controlled and you know the, the, the uh, <laughs> topics covered by that media are, are, are not uh, always uh, completely reflecting what's happening in that situation or in that country, then the World Service in your language can be, can be a lifeline for, for, for that kind of information. So I think it's something that, that Magda and I are kind of proud to, to work on and, and, and you know, be a part of because um, it, you know, it feels like kind of quite public servicey. Um, but having said that, from, with my kind of engineer's hat on, uh, it's, it's complicated and, and, and you know, just sort of thinking of it as a front-end proposition, you know, 40 languages. Um, sometimes we're talking about embedded fonts. We're talking about not just Latin, but, you know, Cyrillic and Arabic. We're talking left to right rather than right to left. Um, it's evolved over time. It started off as a few services, and now it's many. So, um, and you'd think we might have been clever and built one service that then just does translations, but no, it's lots of separate bits of services tied together with spaghetti and string and, and, and so on. Um, and in terms of the audience to, 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 to that content, um, we don't have any kind of sign-in. Um, you'll have seen the BBC, those of you who use iPlay, you'll have seen BBC starting to experiment with sign-in for its services now, thinking about a kind of post-license fee future maybe. But right now, for news, and, and certainly for World Service, um, there's no uh, mandatory submission of personal data when you, when you uh, consume our content. You know, we have basic HTTP headers, um, but, but that's about it. Um, and, you know, rightly so, we don't want to necessarily know your, you know, gender and age and, you know, <coughs> where you live in North Korea and all those kinds of things. It's, it's you know, it, I, I think there's kind of a good case for, for, for us keeping our relationship with our, with our audience fairly um, hands off. So I'm going to sort of talk through some of the steps we've been going through over the past six months, nine months actually, since, since, since Magda joined the BBC, uh, to try and bring some... Um, data science and kind of uh, algorithmic intelligence into the editorial production process that goes into um, BBC World Service. Um, why do we care about this? Well, it, this graph is showing uh, weekly reach uh, measured by browsers to um, all BBC World Service sites over, over the past nine months. Uh, in 2017, BBC received a substantial investment from the Foreign Office to, to kind of grow the World Service, and they gave us an ambitious target of reaching 500 million weekly users. Um, I, without going into the specifics of, 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 of our current reach, there was a kind of green line that showed our you know, trajectory going towards that 500 million over the past year, and it's kind of flat, actually, rather than like that. Those of you who are interested in social and search, that blue line and the yellow line at the bottom, those are referrals to us, blue from Facebook and yellow from Google. That dip you see in around January is, is, is when Facebook decided that news was no longer an important thing to include in people's uh, uh, feeds. <coughs> Uh, and you can see it's, you know, the, the kind of uh, aggregate number of, of browsers across the top has kind of really um, felt that as well, I think. So, uh, yeah, this, this notion of um, our dependence upon social and search for discovery is, is, is another challenge that we face. We've tried, we've launched some new sites, new language services, we've tried different content formats, but still it remains pretty flat. Um, we do have quite a large audience, so um, the problem isn't necessarily one of audience acquisition. Each week we have... Um, many millions of people coming into um, BBC News language services globally. Um, the trouble is they just consume one page and bounce and then we don't see them again. Uh, and so it's not so much an acquisition problem as a retention problem. The, the graph you can see of the, the two pink bars, um, that's week one and then the following week. So that's, that's a very typical week. This is the Spanish language service, which is called Mundo. Um, and in, uh, only 11% of the people we see in the first week, we see again the next week, the remaining guys, we don't know where they go. But they don't consume our content. The, gra the graph on the, um, on, on the right, on your left, sorry, uh, those of you who work in digital publishing will be familiar with this idea. It's that it's um, if you can somehow drive um, consumption of content, then you might actually drive retention and, dr and drive kind of loyalty and get people to come back more frequently. So if we, if we think of this as a problem of why are people only consuming one single piece of content and how can we get them to consume a second or third piece of content, then that should correlate with you know, coming back again that week or next week or, and, and, and kind of building a sense of brand loyalty. <coughs> 
So how can we do that? Well, what we probably can't do is hire a load more journalists. Sadly, that would be lovely. Um, but but um, to quote the, um, the boss of news, James Harding, until recently, the answer to all of the BBC's problems can't just be we hire another 100 journalists. There needs to be a better way of, of, of doing this. So um, the little robots on this thing are to kind of indicate our, our thinking at the moment is that there is stuff that we could do that A, doesn't require hiring more editorial resources, and, and, and B, doesn't interfere with the current editorial workflow, if you like. So similarly, we, we don't necessarily want to interrupt journalists who've got deadlines, and you should really be out kind of covering stories and creating content and say, guys, would you mind just like creating some really compelling onward journeys in the middle of this story? Because that would help to drive our attention. That wouldn't go down well. So instead, algorithms, obviously. Um, so how do we do that? Well, a year ago, we didn't have any data scientists. Actually, we had one guy who said he was a data scientist, but, but he left. Uh, so so um, uh, we, uh, we were very uh, fortunate to have Magda join us last year. And she's currently in the process of uh, creating a data science team within BBC News. Commercial break for uh, hiring advertisements. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're hiring. Uh, yeah, but no, th I mean, th th this is a thing. So there are some skills that we do have. You know, obviously, we have engineering. Um, we have some good analysts. But uh, in terms of that kind of algorithmic thinking, that's for, for the BBC, we're kind of playing catch up a little bit. A lot of our competitors have been doing this for much longer. New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian. Yeah, so, so we're a little bit behind the curve on that. So um, we defined the problem, <coughs> as I've just described, um, made sure it was aligned with business priorities. So for the business, it's not just about reach. That's obviously a thing because, you know, money and foreign office and all that. But actually, they're also concerned with things like um, breadth and diversity of content. So making sure that we're reaching, you know, a female audience as well as a male audience or a younger audience as well as, as, well as the kind of traditional BBC white middle-aged male audience. Um, and, and, you know, those kinds of things. We had to make sure that what we were proposing was, was like aligned with the potential to address some of those challenges too in future. Um, so yeah, we pitched to senior managers and to, and to finance. We got some funding. Uh, we, and, and we're now in the process of uh, uh, kind of concurrently hiring and building a team and d delivering the solution too, which is, which is interesting in and of itself. And also kind of stealing people from other teams where those skills exist internally. Now, this isn't necessarily all fun because the BBC is, is, is a complex organization. Um, in my intro, um, it was mentioned I worked for a company called Simulacra Media. That was 100 years ago. But they, uh, there was 17 of us. And BBC is about 17,000 employees globally. Uh, so it's kind of a, a leap for, um, for me. And, and, and you know, working within that kind of scale of organization, I'm sure there are some of you here who work for, for large scale organizations too. You get these silos. And, and there's a tendency for those silos to kind of claim ownership of a business problem or business area and to kind of maybe even compete with each other as to so, you know, no sooner did we say, we're going to build like algorithmic recommendations for news. A team popped up in Shepherd's Bush and said, no, we're doing that for iPlayer and you can't do it because we're doing it first. And so um, what we're trying to do and what Magda's been like, amazing at doing is kind of building a sort of, what do you call it, a co-op, a data co-op. Data cooperative. <laughs> data yeah. cooperative, right, across the BBC. So that uh, instead of competing with each other, we talk to each other and share code. And this, this kind of uh, graph is showing that the work that we're doing with Mundo right now, we think could help maybe iPlayer in, you know, six months' time or three months' time or something like that. That quote I've put at the bottom of the, the you said to me the other week about many of the challenges we're facing have nothing to do with data science. It's, it's true. And I'm sure any of you who work in large, complex organizations, you know, you feel that. You kind of go in thinking, right, this is going to be like massive data and, you know, stream processing and algorithms. It's going to be so cool. And you spend a lot of time in meetings arguing with people about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, another challenge has been, um, I mentioned spaghetti earlier on in terms of describing the BBC uh, web infrastructure. And this, is, this, this sequence diagram is talking about uh, how we do testing on the front end. Um, this was a challenge. Um, so for us to be able to know if our recommenders are any good, we can't just you know, plonk them in a page and count the clicks. We need to know what difference have we made. So we want to MVT you know, recommendations versus no recommendations, or content similarity versus most popular, or so on and so on. You know? so, so we needed an MVT framework. We used a third party system called Optimizely. Um, so going along to the kind of engineering teams who were already <laughs> responsible for keeping the ship afloat and making sure that the World Service websites load as quickly and painlessly as possible and saying to them, we'd like to include a, a large third-party JavaScript library in your page. Would that be OK? Uh, that doesn't necessarily win you many friends. But I think we, you know, we took them on a journey and, and, and got to the point where we could do it as painlessly as possible. So for example, our recommendations post-load rather than pre-load. They're not blocking JavaScript. So it's all very you know, uh, friendly in terms of the audience. So we ran our first test in December. Um, last year, uh, and this was just testing what would happen if um, we embedded in a story page um, some links to related content after paragraph six or paragraph 12. 
Should it be four links or eight links? And we tested those four variants against each other across all of the Spanish uh, language audience, 100% of the audience. And of course, obviously our metric was, you know, do people click on the recommendations or do they just ignore them and scroll past? Um, yeah, it, people do click on them. It turns out if you recommend content to people, they, they click on it sometimes. Um, that's not necessarily the end of the story, especially for the BBC. And Magda's going to talk about some really interesting thinking around what it means to, to drive clicks if you're a public service organization versus just you know selling advertising, for example. I think that's, that's, that's the whole world of uh, exploration to do there. You can see that um, the green, so the, the winning variant, the one with the little gold cut by it, which drove a 3.3% um, onward journey click-through rate and also a corresponding increase in you know, engaged page views. So we count 15 seconds worth of reading time. It's like, okay, someone's actually can, you know, read the article rather than just bounced. You know. um, however, a decrease in um, story completion. So what is kind of predictably happening is when people reach the recommendations algorithm box, click on something, they don't finish reading the story they were on. Um, we thought this was great, but actually, not everybody agreed. So our editorial um, bosses were like, uh, hang on, this is very bad that people are not finishing the stories. And so we had to do a quick bit of thinking around what actually, what is the thing that we're trying to do here? Is it you know, like, um, um, combined, uh, you know, the total time spent on the site or pages consumed <laughs> per visit? And again, I think this is, this is part of the sort of whole question of what is it we're trying to drive here? You know, and, and, and lots of interesting thinking going on around that right now. Um, Product. So I think Magda and I thought that um, once the experiment had concluded, it was pretty clear that we would want to deploy the winning solution to, 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 the, uh, to the website. This came as a complete surprise to, to our product team and, and engineers who, who, who just assumed we were running the tests because we like tests, I guess. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and, I mean, it um, makes sense, right? You test and deploy, right? And so three months later, the default solution was deployed at the end of February. Um, so it took, six, it took us six months to get to that, which I think in your, in your original timeline was three months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there we go. So, anyway, uh, and yeah, I, I also, <laughs> the, the, the Friday, the, the, uh, the Friday, 5 p.m. on the Friday, that the test concluded, our project manager sent me you an email saying, uh, guys, I've got another job somewhere else, so I'm off. Thanks for the, uh, <laughs> yeah. thanks for, thanks, thanks for the interesting project. Uh, and so I, yeah, dusted off my copy of Project Management for Dummies, and, and, we, and we carried on to M MVT2, or Test 2. Uh, and, and this one is the one that's currently running. In fact, if any of you have got phones or, or, or browsers open, if you Google BBC Mundo uh, and then choose an article, um, you'll get either the um, most popular stories or... Yeah, <laughs> oh, God. It's going to now go <laughs> down. Like, it's, it's uh, uh, I, I, either either uh, uh, um, recommendations based on currently popular stories or recommendations based on content similarity, which is a much more kind of interesting and you know, uh, algorithmically interesting uh, <laughs> bit of recommendation. Uh, and and that's, running, that's been running for four weeks now. Uh, I think it will conclude soon. We'll analyze that and see which is the winning variant. And also, there's been some interesting sort of thinking around segmenting the audience based on what information we have. So that, this, this silly picture of me and, and my colleague Marta, our business analyst, like smiling is because there's a, if any of you have worked on like production software uh, that kind of you know, affects millions of people, it's like it's a real buzz to see it actually working. So what we're looking at there on both of our phones is uh, it was the article about Stephen Hawking and dying recently. And uh, I got one recommendation system and she got a different one. That was like, yay, personalization, it, it works. I know. Oh, <laughs> it's something very, you know, when something works, it's just, you know, nice. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was, that, was, that was a happy thing. As we started to look at the results, though, um, so this, this graph is showing um, page load time. Um, kind of proxied locally. So uh, this, it, anything that's red or orange is unacceptable, according to, 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 to these things. That means more than several seconds for the page to load. So we reckon uh, the, the target audience for the Spanish language service, which is Mundo, um, we think the average page load time is about six or seven seconds, um, which is kind of a long time. And this is blocking JavaScript, too. This isn't us. This is other stuff on the BBC website. So. I don't know, adverts or you know, surveys or stuff like that. So this, that's kind of six or seven seconds of looking at a blank white screen on your phone, which some people won't wait for. So um, a chunk of our, of, of our um, people who were kind of like landing and being bucketed into one of the different test variants weren't actually ever getting recommendations delivered to them, and we think that's because of this problem. So we've currently set up a little side project to work with the front end teams for the different language services to see if we can help them strip some of the crud out of their, uh, out of their pages and, and speed up load time. I mean, that's, that's kind of a good thing, actually. In terms of like, organizational complexity and some of the pain I alluded to earlier on, the idea that you know, one project sort of sparks off another line of thinking that probably is a beneficial thing for the wider organization, I think, is, is, a, is a positive thing for us. 
So yeah, initial results um, are looking promising. What we're starting to see with content similarity, for example, um, is that for people coming in from search, they're tending to have a pretty decent click-through rate on a, on a story that's got similar content and you know recency and relevancy to, 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 to the thing they're reading. Um, and you know, you could hypothesize based on that that search audiences are quite sort of story orientated. You know, you've just Googled Syria missiles or something like that. You want, you know, you've got the latest what's happened, but you also want to know more about the kind of context. Conversely, people coming in from social are more interested maybe in breadth rather than depth, and we've seen a decrease for, for um, content similarity of, of, of click-throughs to, to the recommendations, but it's doing much better for, for more popular. So maybe search depth, social breadth, you could start to hypothesize, and these are the sorts of things we're, uh, we're currently investigating. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Magda now, who's going to talk about science. Thank you. <laughs> well, a little Thank bit. You. Um, so, so how it actually works. This is how it works. Um, <laughs> The uh, one of the kind of a joys at the at the very beginning for um, uh, you know, when uh, when when we started with the, at the BBC thinking about the recommenders was okay let's just put it on the paper and design the whole system and kind of a, how can we take it from the uh, from the concept that then translates into some kind of a process diagrams into some kind of a in, uh, infrastructure and so on so so that was one of the kind of a first conceptual ideas of how this thing is going to supposed to work um, so and and again here it's not it's not something uh, breakthrough it's not something very different to many many places have um, especially uh, places like Netflix and, and Washington Post and all those guys that are very, very digitally oriented, uh, they already figured it out how to, how to kind of connect and match that what's going on on the front page and how to, how to actually plug the uh, offline uh, data-driven products into that site. Um, so we have that online, online layer where um, there has to be a box on the page that we can populate with recommendations. Uh, there is some kind of a logic in terms of um, how do we... Uh, root the system, so how do we recognize and what do we uh, have to do in terms of segment the user, so understand who you are on the page and, and therefore understand what kind of uh, recommendations, the re recommendation, um, recommendations to serve to you uh, is what we call near line and then offline and again, even within that offline stage um, or <coughs> offline layer, depending on the le recommender, they have a combination of slightly closer to online and, and completely offline training and, and rerunning the model. So, um, so those are the layers. Then within that offline layer, I think the key to that, uh, to that system was that we can plug in different APIs um, that are decoupled from the front end and we can iteratively uh, evolve and develop new things. Um, and so we started, Jeremy was talking about the, the first test. The first test was basically start to establish the baseline. So what is that default uh, way of recommending content and we went for most popular people sometimes go with random uh, It doesn't really matter. It, it has to be something that is simple and that creates that baseline for algorithms um, then uh, Content similarity that's something that is more concentrated on okay. What kind of a similar content we have? Uh, ac across our articles or videos or any other content points uh, and in con similarity in the mathematical terms and actually for that one we are using um, uh, word embeddings as well and, and uh, nearest neighbors to, to calculate the distance. Uh, Costas is talking about embeddings uh, very well. So, um, so this is what we use as well. And then kind of other concepts like user profile. So well, how do we use the histo browsing history of the user to match it to the recommendations? Uh, or uh, the, third, uh, the fourth one, user to user, so it's more kind of a rel relative to, um, you know, you are similar to those other users. Uh, so it's kind of a, a complexity, it's very different as well across all of them. So anyway, so um, I think when, when I started um, last year um, at the BBC, um, I was super excited about the, um, the amount of data and, um, you know, I know um, JT mentioned that anonym, anonymous problem of the World Service uh, audience, but in a way, well, it doesn't really matter that much. We still collect a lot of data. And one of the things that was to me really, really exciting was the content metadata. And actually last year in Data Science Festival, I was talking, I was still at the Telegraph and I was talking to 
uh, to you guys about uh, how um, basic the, in the knowledge about content uh, at the Telegraph was and how much work and what kind of a hoops we went through to actually generate and, 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 and reach it. Um, and then I joined BBC and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I don't have to do it anymore. It's just fantastic because it all exists. Um, and actually BBC has a BBC Things, which is an API that you can access um, publicly. But what is behind this is there is this amazing graph store. Uh, Jeremy loves talking about this. So if you have any questions, he'd be very, very happy to answer. <laughs> uh, but it's an amazing piece of infrastructure that it's a triple store that stores all the tags about the content. So that was exciting. The other exciting thing that BBC has done is a tool that's called Telescope. And uh, it's a very smart tool for journalists who, that is um, showing journalists uh, the kind of a real time data about the content. So when they publish article, they can see straight away what is the audience's reaction, what's the engagement, what kind of events are creating um, uh, that uh, uh, performance. Uh, but what is actually really smart is that when they were, when James team was building this, they opened up the data set. So behind it, it's not a closed box. Uh, there is a set of APIs that you can query for real-time data. Uh, and, it's, and it's really, 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 really good. Uh, however, uh, so then I joined and we started to look at um, Mundo. Uh, so Mundo is that Latin American uh, service that we, we chose to be that kind of a sandbox uh, for experimentation. Um, so it's like, okay, we have this bunch of anonymous users, but we have uh, very rich um, content data, we have very rich behavioral data, great, we, can, we have a, just a very, very multidimensional problem uh, that is going to help us describe our audience and back at them in different segments, then understand what their uh, content interests are, and then design recommender. It's a really, really interesting and easy job. However, what we found very quickly is that most of... Um, Latin American audience is interested in Latin America. It's like, well, that's pretty useless. Uh, so we kind of looked at the quality of the tags that are based in that graph, uh, um, content uh, graph uh, behind, the, behind our kind of the content um, uh, base. And it wasn't great, but not because the infrastructure is not great. Uh, the infrastructure is amazing, but the quality of the tags that are currently manually um, annotated by the journalist is just not, not there yet. Uh, we developed this kind of a quality measure that's going to rank the, uh, that is ranking the, the tags against the kind of how broad they are, so how kind of a high level they are. Um, so, for example, Latin America and United States and technology, this, you know, it can be all sorts of content in there, but it doesn't really quite tell me much about the audience's behavior or interests. Uh, but also we have a bunch of those little dots um, that have very little um, amount of content against them, but they're really, really granular. So again, we have this like super high, uh, broad, and, and super, super specific um, tags. Uh, the other problem that we, that we faced is, um, again, we, we talked about this before, right? So coming back to that real-time system where the user lands on the page and then I need to classify them in certain segments in order to serve the recommendations. Well, actually, I have only five dimensions and that was the, like, it was a painful negotiation with the engineering team <laughs> of what, can, what kind of a parameters we can track and we can feed back into that system. Uh, and basically, whatever you can, um, you can uh, retrieve from the, uh, from the header, that's it. So things like, uh, operating system, referral. Uh, we argued a lot about the scene before, which is basically a cookie installed in the browser, whether we should or could. or uh, And that was a really kind of a long conversation. Um, we also have device type and, and what kind of a browser they use. So this is my five dimension, that's it. And I have to decide based on that um, what the user wants. So anyway, uh, so then we decided, okay, well, let's worry about this later. Um, let's ignore for now the co uh, content metadata because that's not good quality. It's not going to tell us much. But let's take the behavioral um, beha behavioral uh, data, create lots and lots of features out of it, and uh, cluster the users into into some segments. Uh, and that's how we kind of came up with 17 segments with with distinct behavior. And even from there, we were able to see. Um, 
well, okay, there are segments, <laughs> there are segments that have a particular interest in similar content and segments that are more interested in most popular content, for example. So that's that kind of a serves that starting point to create that segmentation. I couldn't decide whether it's joy or pain. It can, it's kind of cool to, to kind of create a bunch of decision trees and, and decide how to translate the kind of a clustering problem, the unsupervised problem of segmentation into the uh, supervised learning problem where you uh, have to build some rules or some models to classify based on very limited uh, dimensional space. Uh, and that's what happened with those decision trees. Uh, so basically the output of that was like large map of the five dimension that was um, mapping the, the parameters into specific segments. And this is what is basically that um, segmentation layer. Okay, time to test some some uh, some algorithms and yeah that was that was super exciting because we're like wow so now we have that default test done so we tested the most popular um, now we have a new recommender that's content similarity so now we can test personalization because we also have the segmentation which is very exciting and um, and uh, sounds pretty simple however in the kind of experimentation framework and experimentation mindset is okay we have control group and we have variant a or more variants and we we change one thing and we trying to understand how that thing impacted behavior whether it has generated some significant uh, variance in in behavior however in the um, in when you launch a personalized algorithm that is going to de de deliver different experience to different users it's not about variant to variant. It's not about API to API test. So that that thing here, sorry, that thing here, when you have like this variant one, variant two, doesn't really apply because you need to differentiate the experience based on the segment. Um, and also, what's important is that the reason why we're doing personalization is to create better experience, to get people more engaged, and therefore move them around the segments. So within the test, or even within the visit, one person could have landed on the page as a one-hit wonder. So at the bottom of that, of that kind of engagement um, on segmentation, so I'm landing for the first time. I never be on that page. I'm a one-hit wonder first time, and then I'm suddenly f seeing those recommendations. They're amazing. So I keep clicking, and suddenly I'm becoming a binger. So I moved from to a different segment, um, and that needs to be reflected in in the test whether. Did you want to ask a question? Oh, yeah. So, so this is uh, the one is engagement. So <laughs> it's expressed in. It could be expressed in anything. It could be dwell time. It could be pages per visit. It could be whatever you kind of a uh, uh, define en engagement. And then the other one is retention. So that the, Jeremy was talking about how retention. Um, how the, the, there is a correlation between the engagement and retention, and retention is our metric. So we want people to stay engaged and come back. So the, the, uh, the, 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 the key was, in order to move with the segment, was to define a clear hypothesis. And that was not such an easy concept to explain. And we, it took us days to actually talk about this and explain that we need, we're not testing everybody gets one recommender, everybody gets another recommender, and then make a decision. We need a variant that is going to differentiate that experience. Uh, so it's going to reflect how that system would work in the in the real time, and have um, you know this segment uh, gets this recommender and so on. So that took us a, lot, a, a bit of time, and also, BBC has this beautiful mindset of uh, making everything perfect um, and making everything so that uh, in case something big happens and and people really need access to news and people really need access to information we keep on running and, and nothing fails over and this is amazing but also really really painful because the experimentation mindset is slightly opposite we come in there you know sitting in the basement uh, data scientists uh, next to the, the, the journalist and say, like, you know what, don't worry about this. We just put something together, we're going to give it to the audience, and then we're going to see how it works. That's a kind of a two opposite, two opposite things. Um, so it took us a lot of phone calls, a lot of conversations between different locations to actually start, start that test. But the key is to, 
to say, well, actually, start the test and start recording data, because then you can understand what went wrong. Just not, not starting the test is not going to help you, because you're not going to move, you're not going to understand anything. And the real joy, so the real joy, and um, um, I think it's, uh, it's the real joy and the big, biggest kind of a challenge uh, is the fact that um, BBC has, has its um, remit and, um, and values, and uh, they, um, they're very truthful <coughs> to it. Um, and I think we need to take uh, part of the responsibility for it uh, when we are building any machines behind the, the BBC platform. Um, so Jeremy showed you the outcome from the, from the test. Um, and usually you kind of, you know, you optimize, you, you choose your metric, uh, click-through rate on the component is a standard metric that um, that's relevant for recommenders. But for the BBC, it's slightly different because we we don't necessarily care only about the click-through rate. And the reason why is because the 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 way it normally works is that the click-through rate is increased as a function of something, some kind of a behavioral. Uh, or some characteristics of the uh, suggested content. And usually we can kind of describe them in a um, in, in few concepts or metrics. Um, diversity would be one of, one of them. So like the diversity of recommended content it could stimulate the audience to click more. Um, novelty of displayed and suggested content also can stimulate people to click more. The same surprise, Al, is that something new to me or am I surprised with this recommendation? Is that something that's going to drive me to click? So, th so the click-through rate is a function of those things and probably other things as well. Um, the challenge with, with normally um, kind of a normal approach or commercial approach specifically uh, to recommenders is, is that the flippant nature of humans is that we don't really like to be proposed or uh, suggested diverse content. Because if I'm in my, you know, kind of in my, if I'm in my uh, cute puppy zone or like pictures of, <coughs> of whatever thing zone, like I just enjoy clicking on this, um, and that's that is feeding that that kind of system. And if the machine doesn't take the responsibility for changing that behavior. Um, that just drives that kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of uh, those danger or pitfalls of, um, of recommenders. So uh, things like filter bubbles and echo chambers, we could spend a lot of time discussing definitions and, and discussing what it is. But it is a worry for, uh, for the BBC because that's not how we, that's not what we paid for. That's not what, uh, what, um, what we represent. So that's why we started to think about, we call it have some salad function, uh, or actually I call it have some salad function, I don't know. And this is like a disgusting feature of salad, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I was like, who wants that? Um, but the thing is to redesign, redesign your cost function or your objective function or, or scoring methods in such a way that it, it reflects all those issues. And there, it is possible to define and describe in a mathematical form uh, all those concepts like diversity, novelty, and surprise uh, And then also compare it against our editorial guidance. So you're not only optimizing for increased click through rate, you're optimizing for the balance of all those um, metrics against the editorial guidance and against the retention of the, of the user. And this is how the public service algorithm was born, and that's kind of a concept that we talk a lot uh, internally and externally, and, and we work with universities and, and work with other organizations to try and define this. But basically, to me, it has four components. It's about the inputs and data sets. So are we going to use your uh, personal information to drive uh, your engagement? No, uh, because we have right people in place to think about these things and design them. Um, we also are responsible for delivering the right uh, transparency to the user uh, about how we do it, um, and then start really coding it, so making it a part of our system. Uh, and it's an evolution, like it's not, it's not going to happen on day one. Uh, the definition of those things is quite difficult, um, and it's going to be evolving, uh, but we need to start thinking about it now. Uh, 
So yeah, so just quickly, how, how does it work? So for example, novelty, and I think the key to this is that it is possible to express it mathematically and in a quite a simplistic terms as well. So novelty is basically a, a, a mathematical distance between the uh, content that is recommended, so the vectors that are recommended to you versus the vectors that you've already visited. The surprise out is could be, for example, uh, could be an information gain or uh, mean self information used in computer science. So, how many new bits of information am I delivering to the user with recommendations? Um, and comparing to the most popular, uh, popular, for example. So, like if you think probabilistically about uh, reading a most popular. Um, article, you're not surprised at all with that article because you probably read it and it's really popular. Um, so the surprise is very low in that case. And then least diversity as well. Um, so this is how, what's the mathematical distance uh, between, between all the um, uh, uh, recommendations within your list. So yeah, so just to wrap up, I think we opened with this kind of a uh, chat around, well, this is joint pain. I think you know, it's, it's, I think we have a really, really good team and, and really energetic uh, bunch of people, very persistent to, uh, to survive at the, at the BBC. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but also, the, you know, it's challenging, like it's challenging. It's, it's hard work to, to make it happen and, uh, and be a part of that digital transformation for, for the huge publisher as BBC is. Uh, and we kind of, uh, we evolve our thing, when we look back at the presentation, we thought, well, actually, it's not only joy and pain, but it's actually a story of uh, building responsible data products. Like me personally, like what I was doing five years ago, and it was kind of a building stuff that is a little bit detached from the organization, a little bit detached from the actual product. Now this is the real shit, I was going to say, but I'm going to say <laughs> thing. This is the real thing. Uh, Brilliant. Um, <laughs> This is the real thing, and it's a, the complexity comes from that large scale, not only from the audience perspective, but this kind of a massive product that, that we experience in this big organization. I think many, many people have the same experiences in big, big places like, like that. Cool, I think we, we can take some questions, sure, yeah. if you guys have it. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Uh, oh, well, I think you were uh, first, were you? <laughs> uh, so um, I just really wondered how you decided to, or what were the characteristics that made you decide to use BBC Mundo as like the testing ground? Mm -hmm. And also what are probably some good characteristics of uh, like things to like use as testing or sandbox, basically, that's all. Uh, so I think we, so BBC World Service has 40 pages. Uh, we uh, chose Mundo because that was one of the biggest page, uh, I think the biggest page actually, Sightseeing. in terms of, yeah, size, in terms yeah. of um, the, the traffic, so how many people is reading it. So yeah. it kind of gave us that, well, if you do something, we have enough material to test on. Uh, so it wasn't any, any more sophisticated, just like, okay, well, let's take Mundo. I think like part of it as well, actually, the team, so Mundo editorial team, is very uh, good to collaborate, and and they they sit in the in the same building and so on. So those things are important to have those guys on board and and work with them. Uh, Hi. Thank you for this uh, great talk. Thank it you. was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about how you can. Uh, improve the outreach or the retention to the readers, um, but the other user group of all your applications is probably the authors, right? And you touched on the tags. Uh, so I was just wondering, you know, have you thought about um, building tools that help uh, the the authors, uh, for example, I don't know, using uh, variational autoencoders to like generate tags or something like that? Yeah, we have a lot. In fact, uh, we call it tagging fever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that we just ident well, not just, well, we, we spent some time identifying what the problem really is uh, in terms of tagging and how can we resolve it. And I think now we have a really good plan in place to address it through introducing uh, algorithmic ranking system uh, to 
auto-generate some uh, suggestions for the journalists, uh, overlaying with, with topical uh, tags and so on. So it's, it's going to be, and, and also what's important is it's not only BBC News and the articles, but it's how do we create that framework so that we can connect all content across BIB. Um, like iPlayer, you mm. know, what, what that's that, you know, that would be really cool to be able to connect iPlayer content with BBC News, and it's not as easy as it. I think the the use case has changed a bit too for how we do that kind of semantic annotation of our content. So, when we came up with this idea of journalists tagging content at the moment of publishing, it was mostly about how that would surface to the audience. So, kind of making their stories appear in diverse, you know, aggregations. Mm. So, I tagged this story with Donald Trump Syria. It goes onto the Syria index and the Donald Trump index. Yay! I've published to two places is job done. And then Magda's approach to this has been much more, I need good metadata about the content to understand audience behavior. And, and, mm -hmm. and that for, for me was kind of a new way of approaching the idea of like what metadata is for. I think instead of it being a sort of a route to market, it was actually intelligence back into the business, you know, and I think uh, that has really shone a light on the problem we've got with the kind of uh, loose tagging that's going on at the moment by journalists. So next year, it's going to be about tagging. Thank you. That's very interesting. What are the challenges for the next 39 languages? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> do you think you can go? Yeah. So, <laughs> do you have a few hours? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, one of the things that's at the front of my mind is that um, for content similarity, we're depending upon third-party libraries to do the language yeah. analysis. So. Um, I said at the start, I think in an ideal world, you'd have a kind of one size fits all solution and what we've built works for Spanish. But so the next sites we want to do, um, Portuguese, Hindi, Russian and Arabic, is that four separate applications or yeah. is there something we can do a bit cleverer that would in, you know, should we just use Google natural language processing API and forget about it, but should we then depend upon a third party that might switch it off tomorrow? Yeah. You know, all these kinds of questions are very topical for us at the moment. Definitely the language is, yeah. is a challenge. I think we, we kind of a, we we created that initial system quite um, uh, linked. So uh, the, for example, the pre-processing of the text and the uh, the kind of a doctor vec <laughs> and the recommender uh, kind of a distance happens um, very close, and we need to just kind of work as well as decoupling. So that's one of the change. How do we design that architecture? How do we go around the fact that you know annoy library for uh, pre-processing of the language works only with p five languages rather than 40 languages. So those are the challenges that we have, yeah, definitely. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I think there is one here. <laughs> Do you want to shout, shout out? Oh, sure. I'm going to repeat. Is your optimization only, um, only ever looking one step ahead, or do you ever uh, optimize over a longer journey? So recommending something that's slightly suboptimal for that first step, but then leaves yeah, <laughs> that's very clever. I was for a friend, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so the question was whether we, uh, oh gosh, I don't know whether I can repeat that question. Uh, whether we we think about optimizing for the whole journey, for that end goal, rather than for only kind of optimization at that moment in time. time. Yeah, uh, not yet. Uh, that's a future. So we have. I think it's kind of a, that recommender, recommenders will become kind of a, like a next best recommendation across thing, which is more looking at, well, somewhere at the end, I want everybody to be like super engaged and, and, and really um, staying long on the <coughs> BBC, coming, coming back off and consume tra uh, content across the, the BBC um, and also increasing reach uh, in, in various demographics. So. Yeah, so is it, is it worth to take a, a hit now in that visit, but make sure that you come back? Yeah, de definitely that's within plans, but that doesn't happen yet. Okay, I think that's about all we have time for. Cool. Thank I thought you. that was a super interesting talk, so please do a big thank you. To my